So, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Kai. Uh, I am traveling around, basically bouncing around the world with together with Leo. Uh, it's also a net node. Uh, some of you guys probably seen us before, and the ones <laughs> who haven't seen us before will have to wait until next time before they say they've seen us before. Um, so anyway, what's new in Netnode? Um, well, let's see if the clicker works. I pointed somewhere. Oh. Anyway, uh, who are we at Netnode? Uh, we haven't been in Finland very long, uh, just since the beginning of this year. And uh, what we are, we are a neutral internet infrastructure organization. We're owned by a non-for-profit organization as well. And we are the largest ISP operator in the Nordics, so we have presence uh, in all of the Nordic countries. Uh, we also manage iRoot. Uh, we will go into that more detail later. Uh, we provide DNS services to TLDs and CCTLDs. And we also provide time and frequency services. So uh, we do kind of a mix of things. But the IX part is the biggest one that we do, actually. Uh, so this is basically how our network looks right now. Everything is interconnected, so uh, you can reach everything from everywhere, basically. Uh, we have a peak traffic about 2 terabits per second, and 200 plus connected ASNs. And I started working for Netnode 2002. Uh, most of you guys know, know Curtis, I guess. Curtis Linguist, yeah, it's his fault. <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyway, uh, and that's why I know that we haven't had a single time where both of our peering lands, uh, we, I'll go into that later, how they're divided, but if you're connected redundantly, you are connected to two peering lands. And we haven't had a single incident where both of those peering lands has been down at the same time since I started working there in 2002. Now, I'm not saying it's because of me, I'm just saying that I, I don't know before that because I wasn't in the company before that. So <laughs> that's how long I got the data. Uh, so, Finland, uh, we rolled out here early uh, 2002, and we're at uh, Digita, and HE7, and also HE6, because you interconnect via the campus, and uh, of course in HTC, Telia. So, uh, we, and these sites, as I said, are also interconnected to, well, Stockholm or Oslo or wherever you want to go. Um, we have a little special offer to connect to us, and it's free of charge until, until uh, July 2023. And uh, so basically what you have to pay is your cross-connect in one of the data centers. And you can do that on 10 or 100 gigs, that's fine. And you also get a free uh, 1 to 10 gig remote IX connection to go to wherever you want to go. In, in our network. So most often you would probably want to go to Stockholm because there you got 200 plus ASNs connected. So there can shift a lot of traffic. Um, as I said, uh, the way we've built our networks is uh, because of your, <laughs> your eastern neighbor. <laughs> uh, back in the days during the Cold War, we started building everything in nuclear bomb proof bunkers. And we've done that ever since. So all our core is always down in nuclear bomb proof bunkers. And the core is also always built with a green network and a blue network, and they're completely separated. So whenever we do an uh, upgrade or a service or whatever, we always do, like let's say, the green first, and then a week later we do the blue. So we never do them at the same time, which means that you can always stay up if you're connected redundantly. Uh, you can also, because of demand from the industry, uh, you can also connect with a single link, of course, and then you get both the VLANs on that single link. However, if we do a service or if something breaks on that sp specific switch that you're on, then of course you're going to lose your connection, right? So uh, the best thing is to be redundant if you use us for redundancy. Uh, CDNs and so on, they don't care because they use multiple IXs as redundancy instead. So it's like if Stockholm is down, then Helsinki is up, and if Helsinki is down, then maybe, I don't know, London is up. So they don't basically care. But for normal carrier networks, it's always good to have sort of a, a reliable point. And uh, here in Helsinki, in HE7 and 6, you can connect to both a blue and a green switch locally in that building. 
Uh, in uh, the Telia and the Pasila sites, we only got uh, one color. So if you be if you want to be redundant in those places, then you connect one link there and one to one of the other sites. Uh, if you have like a big need for being fully redundant in one of the other sites, then please let us know. We can probably fix something, right? Uh, and also, when you do a, a redundant connection, you should always go through another MMR and stuff, so you don't route your stuff through the same MMR in the data center, because then you are not fully redundant, which would be a bit of a shame. Anyway, <coughs> <laughs> next, come on, yep. Um, so, as I said, everything is interconnected with everything, and uh, that means that you can also do private VLANs if you want to. If you want to go from here to Copenhagen, and uh, instead of building your own network there, you can actually use ours if you want to for doing a provide VLAN. Uh, we also do shaped ports because nowadays you can get an LR400 gig or LR100 gig cheaper than uh, a packet of snacks, right? So before it was uh, made sense to sort of build, uh, to build with 10 gig ports. But if you got a, a capable switch with 100 gig ports, then it's easier to build with 100 gig port and say, okay, I want 20 gig or 30 gig. And that's what you pay for. And then when you want to upgrade, uh, you can do that very fast. Yes. Are those all the options? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you want 72.5, <laughs> we can probably fix that too. But yeah, we try to keep it to those options because uh, it will be a lot easier to sort of manage it. Uh, you can also do shape port on a 10 gig if you want to do that, but yeah. Um, hmm. Anyway, also uh, you can also do the remote pairing. As I said, if you're connected here in Helsinki, you can connect to wherever in our network. And uh, I mean, it's perfect for you because you don't have to pay extra cross connects. You get secure transport in our network. And uh, if you're connected redundantly, you get full redundancy as well. And even if you aren't connected redundantly, our uh, transport is re fully redundant. So if somebody blows up or digs up or whatever with a fiber, then uh, at least there should be one more way, at least. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's free until uh, June. Uh, also with this, uh, we can talk about RTT a bit. Uh, to go from any of our POPs here in Helsinki to uh, any of our pops in Stockholm is around uh, seven milliseconds in round trip time, and this is up to I mean to the pairing fabrics, so it's pretty fast. You can, I think maybe you can o almost call it uh, local. <laughs> uh, we also do a lot of community stuff. Uh, we are heavily involved in the Route Server Support Foundation. We uh, uh, also uh, support OpenBGP and stuff because we also want that uh, the, the route servers are a very central part of all IXs, as you probably agree. And so far, everywhere in the world, or in the Europe at least, everybody's running Bird, which is excellent, but it's a single piece of software. So that's why we also want support to have other softwares running like that. So we've been basically with that for the start and we are continuing support for it. Uh, then we also have the European Peering Forum. How many of you have been at the uh, EPFs? Ah, okay, a couple. Okay, so put it in your calendar to go to the next EPF. Uh, the EPF is, I would say, the best place to meet other networks, CDNs, whatever. And also to, to get uh, traffic flowing in a better way. Uh, you'd be amazed on how many uh, sort of traffic optimizations has happened in the hotel bar. Uh, I mean, for sure, it, it, it's it's really it's really helping the community to to do this because you will meet yes. So, uh, if a small physics or tracks member wants to uh, attend uh, EPF, uh, mm -hmm. how is how does the registration work? You basically go in on uh, the EPF homepage. Uh, I can link you to that later, and you just register. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so it used to ask if you are a member of M6 or exactly. Uh, you you <laughs> you should be a member to one of the IXs. Uh, and now, which IXs are we talking about? Uh, 
we are four IXs who arranged this. Uh, I it's uh, Netnode, DKIX, Lynx, and AM6. Every fourth year, one of us runs it. So th that means that uh, this year uh, was in Italy, and it was run by Lynx. And next year is in Prague, and that's run by Netnode, actually. So that's what we do. And uh, if you are, I mean, if you are a small IX, uh, then sign up for our free port. <laughs> And then you can go. Then you can uh, register for this. <laughs> and then after you have registered, you can sort of say we don't want to port. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's an idea. I mean, uh, it, it could be. It, it's definitely a good way to to meet the rest of the community. You can go to a lot of other of the peering. Yes, again. <laughs> so uh, the event, as if I understood. It correctly, it's free for the members of the four IXs. Yes. But if you are not a member, I believe you can still get in with a. Yeah, small then fee. you can pay. For, yeah, exactly. I just wanted to help you not having to pay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can of course pay a ticket to get in there, and that's that might also be a very good solution. Uh, but uh, said me and Leo, we do a lot of the events. Uh, like GPF is also a good one, the Global Peering Forum. Uh, but okay, I might be a bit skewed here, but uh, I really like the EPF the best because no, but it's, it's a really nice community and people are very open and talkative, and you will see actually more international networks at the EPF than at the GPF, which is fascinating in a way. So you have, I mean, you have a lot of networks coming from all over the world to the EPF. On GPF, the of course there's also from all over the world, but the, the there's a lot of American networks mainly. So, might be worth thinking about. Uh, anyway, what else is new? Uh, we have done a new customer portal, and now you say, yay, great, another fucking portal with passwords and stuff and weird uh, interfaces. And yeah, we know, but we hope this will actually provide some good stuff for, for everyone. And we've been looking around at a lot of other uh, customer portals and try to find out what's really bugging us and make sure not to do the same thing and also find out what's what people want and try to put that in there. So right now at least you can see your traffic stats. That's pretty basic, right? But you can also see bit errors, light levels, and you can see light levels over time. So you can see if a laser is degrading or a fiber is getting bad or something like that. You can see your invoices and contracts and uh, also all the technical details. Uh, there will also be a lot of other features coming up, so you can upgrade your port directly to a portal and uh, order other kind of new services. There will also be, you can s so you can see that you got the right MTU sizes and, and all other fun stuff, basically. Yep. So is it possible to log into this system using peering DP accounts? No. Have you <laughs> considered that? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, we'll see, because uh, we we want to have somebody uh, who has the account that, that we can directly sort of keep accountable for what they do in there, <laughs> for, for their network, right? Uh, so yeah, but yeah, that's an, that's an interesting idea that I can ponder about. Thanks. Anyway, so this is the looks uh, of the basic interface. The, yeah, the resolution is a bit not there right now, but this this is just uh, something I went in and I, I chose the traffic patterns for AS8674 in the local IX and yeah. And you can see uh, if your invoices is there, which of course they're not because we're not paying for our own service. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you got, uh, you can see the different services, your billing, blah, blah, and this is a bit, yeah. And then you can also see uh, uh, more about your services. Now, it, it's for if a customer logs in, they will have a lot more data than this. I just did a fast screen dump, but that's the stuff I can see because I don't want to put out a customer's data, of course. So I just looked at my own. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I won't bother you about uh, that more anymore. And then we got the DNS nodes. Uh, that was actually a fun thing because we started with DNS nodes back in, well, the idea of DNS nodes came around 2002, 2003 when I started working there. And the idea was basically, so these root servers, they're, they're pretty vulnerable to attack, right? If, if you sort of, there's 13 of them, and if you 
knock out 13 of the 13 root servers, then we are in a world of shit, basically. So the whole internet is going to break, and yeah, that's really bad. So uh, we started experimenting a bit with any casting. So we started making instances of the iRoot server and, and putting them out in the network. And the concept is very simple, but uh, the, the practicalities of it all is actually not that simple. Uh, and it took a couple of years before we got all this up and running. We started building a couple of these instances in Stockholm. And the first one that we actually put outside of Sweden was at Fikix. And uh, it was Curtis himself who went there and sort of put it in. And yeah, quite so. <laughs> as well. <laughs> Yeah, and I was the guy who prepared who prepared it in Stockholm before it was sent here. So yeah, it's uh, a small community. <laughs> uh, and then it sort of just continued that way. And I spent a lot of years during the early 2000s traveling around the world and screwing these things into a rack and then taking uh, the people who had the rack out for dinner and making sure that they were sort of very positive to sort of answering when we had a broken disk and asking them to replace it. So. Then the dinner came in and say, oh, the, these guys were nice and I will replace the disc. Because we found out if we didn't do that, then the disc never got replaced. So, yeah. <laughs> kind of an investment. But now anyway, we are on 80 plus locations uh, all over the world. And uh, we're one of the, the biggest secondary uh, DNS providers in the world, basically, I would say. So, uh, yeah. Uh, this is interesting. So we actually... This year celebrate 30 years of iRoot. Uh, so it was first run by, uh, well, it was actually on uh, KTH where Lehman started running it together with Johan. And Lehman uh, then took it with him to when, when they created Autonomica, which where I started working because Netnode from the beginning didn't have any employees. Everybody was employed and through no Autonomica. And then we fused together with Netnode as one because Basically, everyone who worked for Netnode worked in Autonomica, so it was just two different companies. But all the DNS stuff was with Autonomica. So, Lehman uh, is still working for Netnode. He is the only guy who's been working longer for Netnode than me right now. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. There's going to be some cake with that later on, I guess. Not here, but, yeah. <laughs> it should be, at least. Uh, we also do time and frequency services. And... Uh, that is something we see growing right now, because before everybody was just relying on their uh, uh, GPS signal. And uh, now when uh, your not so friendly neighbor has started sort of messing up the GPS and jamming stuff, then uh, all of a sudden the a lot of people realize that, okay, maybe relying 100% on uh, GNSS systems isn't such a good idea. So. We have been providing time for a, lo for a long time. <laughs> and uh, we are actually the, the ones who are responsible for providing time in Sweden. So uh, we do this with a, a bunch of atomic clocks. They're always uh, doubled, and they have their own battery backup, which then have the, uh, our own back, uh, battery backup in our data center. And then you've got the battery backup from the, uh, the, the cave we're in, the bomb-proof bunker, which then has the diesel backups. So Basically, the idea is that those things should be blinking the longest. When everything else has gone dark, quiet, and dead, then those should be blinking for a couple of hours more. Um, yeah, <laughs> not that anyone can see what the clock is anyway, then, but uh, it's a nice, nice theory. Um, and they are placed uh, all over Sweden. So it's an interesting system. But anyway, we do basically three ty types of services on them. You've got the remote and direct, and then you've got the PTP. And uh, it's basically the remote, then we put up uh, a CP at your place, and you can uh, adjust your clocks from that CP. And then we guarantee like, uh, one millisecond. Uh, direct is uh, even better, because then you can then they interconnect directly into one of our nodes. And uh, yeah, that will <laughs> uh, give you 30 microseconds, which is not nicer. Yes. What sort of interface do you need to connect directly to your uh, node? Well, depends. I mean, we're gonna if if you're gonna put it to our box, then you're gonna have a, a Meinberg uh, box of some kind. Uh, if you like to PTP or something, uh, if you do the CPE thing, then it's actually gonna be a, a, a 
a switch CP, so you can you can choose your interface because they're gonna have a SFP slot or something that that you want to have, right? So the Mindberg would be BNC connectors yeah. and coaxial cable, and then the others are basically some sort of an SFP. Yeah, you can. Th there's a range of uh, interfaces to choose from. So, yeah, we we got some best practices, of course, but you you can. Nobody cares basically when you come out and say no, but we want this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, yeah, this is basically the direct, as I said, network switch. And uh, here you got the uh, time as a service uh, with a CPE, and then you got, of course, the PTP, which is the most, uh, uh, the best one of them all, right? And then you should be down at one milliseconds. So. Uh, well, best of them all. I mean, they're all good at what they do. It's just a different way of delivering time. Uh, anyway, we, we've been involved in uh, building NTS, uh, which is secure uh, NTP. And uh, we also did the f uh, world's first hardware implementation of NTS directly in the ASIC. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a very good working system. Uh, there, there's more information about this if you want it. I'm not working with uh, PTP or uh, time that much anymore, so just let me know. I can for sure hook you up with persons who are really good at this. And uh, yeah, we also have the Netnode meeting. Uh, we really urge you to come there if you want to meet networks. You do not have to be a member of Netnode. You can sign up uh, anyway. And uh, yeah, please join us in Stockholm. It's you, you're going to meet a lot uh, of other people from the Nordic networks and also the European networks coming there. So that could be interesting. And yeah, that should be it. Any questions? Hmm? Hans Tip from Physics. Yeah? Uh, do you have any plans to open other uh, IXEs in Finland? Example in Tampere or in Oulu or other city cities? Not right now, <laughs> but I mean, we we basically don't open any ex IXS unless somebody asks us to. So yeah, <laughs> if you if you have an area where you really want an IX and if you have some traffic that you can sort of say that I've got some traffic, they got some traffic, we, we want to have to build an IX, then please let us know. Huh? Okay. You'll be here uh, all the way to the sauna. Yep. So. If there are any more questions, please save them for, for the dinner or, or the sauna. And I guess I am the reason that you went over time because I <laughs> asked so many questions. So <laughs> I apologize to everyone uh, because coffee should be served at the back. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.